All right, cool. Uh, can you hear me, Nick? All right? Yes, sounds perfect. OK, great. I can hear you as well. So that, that that's a good start. Um, and yeah, so uh, we would have certainly been interested in, in the, the pilot program. We've been developing this library uh, strictly uh, at this point as fans of Flower. So um, we are obviously very, uh, very big um, advocates for uh, what Flower is doing, and, and we've leveraged a ton of the uh, different components of Flower and, and the flexibility that it offers. So um, certainly looking forward to deepening the collaboration with Flower going forward. So um, as Nick said, uh, the library that I'm going to talk about today uh, is FL for Health um, that we've been developing at the Vector Institute. Uh, the title is a, a bit uh, sort of flashy and ambitious, um, but it reflects some of the goals that we're uh, sort of trying to move towards uh, with the library, uh, enabling private and personal uh, clinical modeling um, in collaboration with a number of, of hospitals in Toronto. So before I get started, I just want to acknowledge uh, some other members of the team. On the left, uh, the, the six names um, there are sort of the primary contributors within uh, the Vector Institute. Um, we also have a, a number of contributors um, through our collaborations uh, with either various labs or, um, or different research groups. So uh, I want to give a lot of credit to each of these uh, team members. They've uh, contributed quite significantly to the work. So uh, I want to start with like the mission and design uh, of the library, um, which I think probably dovetails fairly well with Flower in general. Um, but the idea is to make FL research and deployment easier, more robust and reproducible uh, with a specific focus on healthcare and clinical models, obviously in our case. Um, we have sort of three design principles that we've been trying to follow uh, in creating the library um, and, and all of the sort of touch points within it. Uh, we obviously want it to be an open source research grade platform uh, with fairly straightforward and composable modules. Uh, again, that's a, a very similar design ethos to uh, what Flower is, is doing under the hood. Um, we want to facilitate true federated learning training and evaluation at clinical institutions, which we all know is, is really hard because there are a lot of regulations, there's a lot of privacy concerns. Uh, and so we want to design the library to help make that uh, easier. Uh, and then finally, we want to require minimal component definitions uh, to use state-of-the-art techniques, because um, if we're going to solve sort of personalized clinical modeling problems uh, using state-of-the-art techniques, as we've heard from a lot of the talks in the previous day and, and this morning, uh, I suppose in this afternoon for, for everyone in person, um, you, you need to use state-of-the-art techniques to deal with all of the different challenges that we've, we've discussed throughout the summit. Um, another set of things that I want to go over is the framework assumptions. So obviously there are a lot of different forms of FL. Uh, they've been touched on sort of throughout the, the summit. Specifically for us, we are focused on horizontal and uh, cross silo federated learning. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people uh, are fairly familiar with these definitions, but uh, in general, this means that uh, the feature spaces are aligned or will be, uh, assuming that you can uh, do that in a federated setting or sort of with pre-work. Um, but we're uh, primarily concerned with expanding the data set size uh, that we have for training. Um, we also assume in this case there's a, a small or medium sized pool of clients rather than say like uh, thousands and thousands of participants in, in our uh, training regime, um, which you would have in sort of like a phone uh, federated learning setup versus these, uh, these settings that we're looking at are, are things like uh, hospitals or clinical institutions. Um, we also have the luxury of assuming that there's at least a, a reasonable or, or large compute uh, on each of the clients. We don't have to do sort of edge processing um, in our case, and, and that these clients tend to have like a reasonable data set size. They're not like two or three training examples each. Uh, and then finally, that they are reliable participants when called upon in the training process. So um, in the uh, um, cross device setting, you know, you have people dropping in and out, they turn off their phones. Uh, for us, we're, we're assuming that our participants are very willing to be a part of the process and if called upon by the server, they will participate. Uh, lastly, uh, and the, it's sort of um, hinted at in the title of the talk, is that personalization and privacy are important. So heterogeneity is common uh, in hospital data sets uh, when they use different devices or have different patient populations, uh, and site performance is really critical. Uh, and then finally, data assume, assumed to be really sensitive. So obviously, we've talked about that a lot throughout the uh, throughout the summit as well. 
Uh, so I want to start by highlighting uh, some of the sort of major components that we've um, worked to implement in, in hopefully a, a fairly straightforward way across the library. I won't go through everything in, in a lot of detail, but we have a lot of optimization strategies. Some of them are built right into Flower, like FedHav, uh, Average, and, and FedOpt. Um, but a number of them require sort of complex processing or um, complex exchange of information. And so uh, we've attempted to implement optimization strategies in a really straightforward way. I'm going to try and do a little um, sort of code demo to, to give you an idea as to how, how that works for us. Um, obviously, privacy preserving techniques are really important uh, and have built right, been built right into um, the library uh, and, and should be fairly straightforward to use. Um, communication efficient uh, FL. Um, things like partial weight exchange, which is really important in personalization, um, but other things like compression of parameter exchange and that sort of thing are, are inside the library. Um, federated feature processing, I know there have been a, a couple of questions on that. Um, so federated feature alignment is a really important thing um, if you're using tabular data to make sure that everyone is agreed upon uh, the sort of data that's going to be used and, and automated ways to sort of force agreement or induce agreement are, are built into the library. Um, other components that you might want to do as part of a pre-processing pipeline, especially for clinical tasks like dimensionality reduction and synthetic data generation are also available. Uh, and then there's a, a number of sort of miscellaneous uh, and interesting things that are built into the library, like uh, things like federated checkpointing and, and uh, sort of um, expanded probabilistic client sampling and that sort of thing. Cool. So just to touch on some, some results that we've We've used the library uh, to gather so far um, in collaboration with uh, Gemini, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, we've done some clinical benchmarking uh, across a, a number of clinical tasks. Uh, the results you see here are for the Flamby data set. Some people might be uh, familiar with that, but it's an open source uh, um, clinical uh, collection of, of tasks. Or, collection of clinical tasks, excuse me, um, three of which are, are displayed here. So Fed Heart Disease, Fed IXI, and, and Fed ISIC. Um, and using the library, we're able to really quickly uh, benchmark across a lot of different federated learning methods uh, to see uh, sort of the benefits of, of FL in this setting. And you can see uh, the bottom sort of rows here are personalized uh, models. You can see that the personalized models, the, the bolded components and the underlying components, are really improving upon sort of the local training and the, and the centralized training even um, when you, you include personalization uh, for, for the tasks involved here. Um, so those are interesting, they're open source benchmarks and, and it's really important to uh, show federated learning uh, performs well for those. Um, but we're, we've also been working with real uh, clinical data in the form of the Gemini Consortium. They collect uh, data from over 30 hospitals in Toronto uh, and beyond. And uh, this facilitates sort of a really rich proving ground for federated learning uh, tasks on real clinical uh, um, applications. So uh, for instance, on the left-hand side are results for mortality prediction. So predicting whether a patient will experience a mortality event um, within the hospital uh, and based on, based on their sort of labs and tests and, and what they've gone through in their journey at the hospital. And then delirium development. So uh, delirium is obviously a, a very serious development in uh, clinical settings, and uh, it, it is preventable if you are able to um, identify it fairly early. And so uh, identifying delirium development as a risk is is really important. Uh, and uh, you know, again, we see sort of a, a very uh, large collection of of FL. Um, techniques brought to bear on these tasks. And you can see that, uh, again, personalized models are producing um, sort of state of the art, uh, in this case, accuracy and, and AUC ROC uh, for both the mortality and the uh, delirium task over uh, what these hospitals could have achieved um, sort of independently uh, if they train models themselves. Cool. So, uh, as I mentioned, the, the design of the library is meant to make uh, doing this type of benchmarking, especially in clinical settings, um, fairly straightforward. So I want to give uh, you a bit of a flavor as to uh, you know how easy, uh, in in our opinion, doing something like this is for for these applications. So um, assuming nothing has gone horribly wrong, hopefully you can see uh, my code here. 
and Nick, please interrupt me if, if that is not the case. Um, so I'm not just talking to the air. Uh, but in, in this particular set of code, uh, those are, uh, of you who are, who are familiar with how you set up the sort of flower, um, typical flower uh, uh, run and frameworks uh, to do federated learning, you know you design or you define a server.py uh, file and a, a client.py file. Um, and each of those defines how the server and the clients are going to behave together. So this is an example of implementing scaffold, um, which if you're familiar with the method is, a, is a quite a sophisticated uh, uh, method for non-heterogeneous data sets. Um, it's a centralized or global uh, FL approach, uh, but it requires the exchange of a lot of different information above and beyond just the model weights. Uh, and orchestrating that can be sort of very tricky, especially in settings where the model is um, sort of very uh, complicated um, with different types of layers and, and frozen components. Uh, and so uh, in this case, I want to show you how you might bring up your own uh, scaffold method within the library itself. So uh, there's some boilerplate that, that obviously Flower uses, um, like the, the fit configs. Um, there's a definition of a strategy, the client uh, sampling strategy, uh, and then a server. Uh, in our case, in order to, um, to get a, a scaffold application running uh, for your particular use case, uh, you just define a uh, scaffold strategy with all of the sort of same stuff that you might define a strategy in Flower. Um, you also have to send over the model for it to take out some information that it needs from the model. Uh, and then you also have to instantiate a scaffold server. Um, you just give it the same sort of information that you uh, typically give a server in Flower, perhaps with a little bit of additional information. For, for this case, we're doing a warm start for scaffold. Uh, and that's it. Uh, you can sort of kick off your server as you would any other Flower application. Um, and it will, excuse me, handle uh, the exchange of information in the server, uh, the scaffold strategy right out of the, out of the gate. Similarly, on the client side, there's a couple of extra things that you need to do. Your client is going to need to uh, inherit from a scaffold client, uh, and you're going to need to define a couple of sort of integral components uh, for uh, the definition of what the client is going to do on its side. You need to define some data loaders for your train and validation loaders. Um, in this case, we're just doing like a, a Dirichlet sample, subsampled uh, MNIST uh, task. Um, we need to define our optimizer, uh, the loss function that's going to be uh, optimized, and then finally the model that we're going to be optimizing. Um, and that's it. The uh, stuff that's sort of buried under the hood in the scaffold client will handle the exchange of all of the information that the uh, clients and servers need to exchange in order to do a scaffold uh, train. The rest is sort of uh, the same as, as how Flower runs. Uh, I'll do one more one more example here, uh, just to show, um, you know, how you can implement some really sophisticated methods. So I'll start with Ditto. Um, some of you may be familiar with Ditto. I'm just going to move this toolbar uh, from from working with with uh, FL runs. Uh, for Ditto, actually, nothing has to change for us on the server side. You just define the same stuff that you would define for a regular federated average. Uh, training session from the server's perspective, um, and uh, you sort of move from there. Uh, everything, sort of the heavy lifting, is on the client side for Ditto. Ditto trains both a global and a local model and uses the global model to regular regularize uh, the local model training. Um, you just need to inherit from a Ditto client. You need to define the stuff that we talked about earlier, like a data loader, a model, and a loss function to optimize. Uh, and then the only real difference between the example I showed you for Scaffold and Ditto is that Ditto needs two optimizers, one to optimize the global model and one to optimize the local model. As long as you define those uh, and you map them to the global and local models uh, appropriately, uh, you're off and running and a Ditto model can be trained. Uh, and don't worry, uh, we'll sort of uh, warn you very heavy handedly that uh, you didn't define two optimizers under the hood um, if you forget to do so and try and use a Ditto client. Uh, there's also maybe one last example I'll show, uh, which is just around um, partial weight exchange. So for FedPer, it's a uh, personalized method 
that just exchanges components of the model. Uh, and so uh, for FedPer, everything actually is the same, again, on the uh, server side, except for you define a special FedPer model uh, in order to make sure that it exchanges the right, the right weights for initialization. Um, and then on the client side, you define the components that we already talked about, the data loader, the optimizer, the loss function, um, but you instantiate a special model called a FedPer model, which defines what layers are going to be local and what uh, layers are going to be exchanged with the global model. Uh, and the last thing you do is you say, okay, you, do, you override the full model parameter exchanger that's the default in our library. And you just say, I want to use a fixed layer exchanger, and these are the weights, or these are the layers that I want to exchange as defined by the FedPer model. Okay, great. So that's sort of the end of some of the examples I wanted to cover here. Uh, the last thing I want to do is just highlight um, some of our collaborations that we're, we're working on now. Uh, we have a collaboration with the Hader Lab at Mount Sinai Hospital here in Toronto, uh, looking into the efficacy of FL methods for um, this acronym stands for uh, um, clinically significant prostate cancer detection and segmentation. Uh, the question is, can uh, the use of, of multiple hospital uh, data sets through uh, federated learning reduce false positive rates uh, and also known radiologist variance in uh, estimating clinically significant prostate cancer uh, in, in scans? Um, we're also working with uh, Jiho's privacy group uh, at the uh, University of Waterloo um, to improve the utility of differentially private clinical models uh, trained uh, with FL uh, under strong threat models, meaning um, that the, the server may, uh, may be sort of able to manipulate or, or inspect the, the model weights and, and do something nefarious with it. Um, and this is working with clinical data sourced from, from several hospitals in Toronto. Uh, I've obviously highlighted uh, some of our work with the Gemini Consortium. We're, we're continuing to do uh, a lot of work uh, in this area because the consortium is a rich proving ground for FL methods. Uh, and then finally, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, as a group, we're really big flower fans, um, but we want to uh, sort of expand our collaboration. So we're really thankful for the invitation to come and speak here. Uh, and we're hoping to participate uh, in, in future um, programs going forward to collaborate and expand uh, on the offerings within Flower itself. Great, so I left a repository link at the top of uh, this slide if anyone's interested. Um, in checking out the uh, the library itself, uh, and I'll finish there and, and leave it for questions, if any are, are, are out there. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let's start with taking questions online. So, Pan, is there any questions uh, from people, perhaps? No? Okay, that's cool. Uh, how about in the room? I know there must be quite a few. Yes? Um, Hello, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I have a question. Uh, if there is, let's say, a new baseline that is uh, put into Flower, how long does it take to, to bring it to FL for health, or how is the process, more or less? <laughs> that, that's a, a great question. So uh, the process right now is fairly manual. So we're, we've been trying to identify um, promising uh, baselines either through uh, their implementation within Flower um, or you know externally through through our own personal research, uh, and so we transfer them directly into uh, our system. The Flower baselines are are super helpful if someone puts them in there because we can see some of the inner workings of the code and it's very sort of highly polished, uh, which makes our our job sort of abstracting away the uh, the pipeline and, and components and communication uh, into our library uh, much easier. Uh, one of the things that we might um, be working more closely with Flower, uh, and Nick and I have discussed this, is, is how do we streamline that process? How do we figure out a way to um, make that either more automated or, or an easier thing rather than us just sort of picking up promising approaches. Uh, but that's a great question. So right now it's, it's fairly manual. Okay, thank you. More questions? Right here. Yeah, so thanks for the presentation. Uh, just in general, in federal setup, like how many 
high parameter, maybe combination, have you test, or you fix the, from the, the first one and then like yeah, just for the old uh, the method, or yeah, just can you make any comment regarding the hyperparameters? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll put up these. I assume these are the sort of hyperparameter tuning uh, results that you're you're referring to. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but in both of these cases, we we did some extensive hyperparameter tuning, uh, especially for models where, or excuse me, approaches where a lot of hyperparameters are necessary. So, uh, for example, per FCL actually has sort of three major uh, parameters that you need to to tune. Uh, and so we went through sort of an extensive search uh, for this particular approach um, in order to determine what the sort of best settings of the hyperparameters are. Um, and uh, one of the um, sort of benefits of, of the library is that, uh, you know, we, we've sort of built in checkpointing and uh, um, loss aggregation and reporting into the library itself so that we can uh, easily take measurements on the validation set uh, and, and give sort of the best hyperparameter combination uh, that's experienced through those searches. Um, I actually, I don't think we we um, knew about, uh, at least personally, I didn't, uh, the, the new additions of the hyperparameter tuning within Flower. So uh, we might actually uh, be able to integrate more tightly with that as well. Um, but some of the other methods, you know, federated averaging, uh, you know, only really needs the tuning of the um, client-side learning rate, uh, but others like Ditto, for instance, requires tuning of the um, parameter associated with the global versus local model constraints. So um, I don't have a slide with all of the, the hyperparameters tuned, um, but if you go to the library, there's like a little archive uh, link uh, within the readme that you can go and you can actually look into the hyperparameters that we tune for, for each of these methods um, to get these results. Thank you. Cool. Um, other questions? We have, uh, we have time for a quick one. There is. Here comes one. Hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. Just two quick question. As uh, someone that also works with uh, medical imaging data, so kind of a similar setup to what you're showing sure. us. Uh, so the first one is, uh, how did you deal with the fact that these different aggregation strategies might require different hyperparameters when trying to compare them fairly to each, uh, to each other? And the second one is, if you have a current favorite that you would say is worth the trouble over federated averaging. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, so for the first one, I think the, the previous question got to that a little bit, which is to say that for each of these, uh, we tried to um, tune uh, across the sort of most important parameters associated with the models themselves. So uh, again, just to expand upon on that a little bit, like FedProx uh, has uh, a parameter with the, the client learning rate, which most of these models will will have a, a hyperparameter associated with the client learning rate. Um, but in, in addition, it has, you know, it's classic um, proximal term, the, the mu value, if you're familiar with it. Uh, and so we tuned across that one as well, because it's the sort of most important piece uh, in controlling heterogeneous learning and that sort of thing. So in each of these, we did a fairly extensive hyperparameter sweep for all of the methods um, in the components that we, we sort of identified as most important. Um, so that's the the major one that the that we did um, in in both of these studies to control for hyperparameter um, sort of dependencies within the methods. Uh, in the second one, um, I think uh, what these um, results sort of strongly highlight is that personalized methods uh, for these particular applications are all fairly strong. Um, I think. Uh, the two that have been identified here uh, that we think are sort of consistently strong and offer really uh, high performing results are Ditto and FendFL. Uh, you can see here that, um, you know, uh, FendFL is the sort of best performing, second best performing model for these two. And then uh, Ditto uh, is uh, a fairly strong performing model for FedIXI, the strongest for FedISIC, uh, and then the strongest for mortality here. Uh, where again for delirium, um, Fenda has a really strong AUC ROC, if that's what you care about, um, and a very competitive accuracy. 
Uh, so I think those are both really great. Um, we also had a, a really nice talk earlier about uh, MRMTL, uh, which is fairly related to Ditto and uh, FedProx. So I'm actually really excited to go back and implement that because I think we can do that in you know a day in our library really quickly uh, and do some some experimentation. Uh, and so I'm I'm sort of excited to try out some of the methods that uh, we heard about um, in in the talks yesterday. Great. Thanks for the question. Well, that's all the time we have for questions. Let's thanks, David, again. <laughs>